Um, I had sent the message out. Um, since since last week, I I uh, failed again in um, keeping my sermon in a reasonable amount of time. This week, I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to read the uh, all the verses in Esther in these chapters. I hope that you read them ahead of time. I'm just going to summarize the chapters and get to the so what's at the end and hopefully make it a reasonable amount of time. And um, so why, why don't you, uh, why don't, since I forgot my phone this morning, yeah, um, I will use Kayla's so that I can know how late I'm, I'm running you again. Um, so again, last week we covered chapters 1 through 4. And this week we'll go chapters 5 through 10. 10 is only three verses, but... Uh, and again, I hope you read these. Setting the scene that we left off with last week. Um, you know, the, the decree, Haman had got uh, uh, King Xerxes to issue the decree that all Jews would be slaughtered. Not only the Jews in Susa, where they were at, but all throughout the Persian kingdom. And the Persian kingdom included even, uh, you know, the areas of Palestine where, you know, the where some of the Jews had returned from exile to, to the land of Israel and so forth. But uh, kingdom-wide, Persian kingdom-wide, the, the decree had been issued for a, a day set in the future that the Jews, men, women, and children were all to be killed. And so Mordecai is, has, has told Esther she needs to try to plead with the king. And the understanding is that if somebody, even the king's wife, went to him uninvited, it was a death penalty unless the king extended his, his forgiveness or mercy to them. And so with all that, um, Esther, you know, Mordecai had said, maybe it was for a time like this, a time such as this, that you have ended up being the queen of the Persian kingdom. Maybe for such a time as this, you are in that position. And... After some contemplation, Esther said, um, I will do it. Fast. You, you have all the Jews in Susa fast for me, and I, and I and my attendants will fast for three days, and after that, I will go to the king, and if I die, I die. And so that brings us up to chapter 5. The summary of chapter 5 is that after, the, after these three days of fasting, Esther went to King Xerxes, and um, not knowing again how, how he would react, she hadn't, he hadn't called her to him in 30 days. We talked about that last week. Seems weird. But yeah, the king didn't call for his wife to be in his presence for 30 days. And so she wasn't sure how he was going to react. And um, fortunately, he reacted well. And um, he said, what, tell me what you want, and up to my half, half of my kingdom, I'll give it to you. We believe that was like a, an expression, like an oriental expression, uh, meaning, you know, I won't, I won't actually give you my kingdom. I, I'm not going to give you more than what I have, but I'll give you up to half of it. Uh, basically, I'll, I'll give you whatever you want, as long as you're not asking to be king or something. Uh, but that's what he told her. So he reacted very well, very favorably toward her. Um, she didn't make her request then, though. She, she said, she, she told him she wanted what? Yeah, yeah she want, wanted, wanted Haman to come to a banquet with the king. And that would just be Haman and the king and her. And, and that, that's, that's what she wanted. And so, um, so the, uh, Haman, he, he, he came, came to her and, and um, you know, again, the, the, the king said, now tell me, okay, we're here at this banquet. Tell me, what, what is it you want? And again, she said what? I want to throw another banquet for you tomorrow. You and Haman come back. Bring, have Haman come back. You guys come back tomorrow, and we'll do another banquet, and I'll tell you then. Commentators make uh, different guesses as to why Esther didn't ask him right away that first day. Um, okay. I, I'm just, I'm not a lot for guessing um, about why something happened if the Bible didn't explain why. Uh, what I really don't like is some would take that and say, well, now they would basically condemn Esther, say she's, she's second guessing. Uh, you know, God gave her the conviction to do this. She should have just done it. And then they would run off and maybe even preach a sermon on that or a part of a sermon on how, you know, when God brings the conviction, you need to do it right then. You, you can't be like Esther and, you know, so on and so forth. And I really, really get uncomfortable with that kind of exposition of the, of the Scripture to... 
just to do it that way, I think, leads people down a lot of, a lot of wrong ways. In any case, old Haman, he heads home. He's in a great mood. He just had, he had the privilege of having, having dinner with the, the queen and the king, just them. So he's in a great mood, and he's, he's going home, you know, whistling a happy Persian tune or whatever, and all of a sudden he sees something that ticks him off. What did he see? He saw Mordecai who refused to show any fear of him. And so Mordecai had been like the thorn under, under his, his saddle, you know, the, the, the burr in his, in his backside. Um, and, and Haman gets all ticked off because Mordecai shows no concern, no fear of him or anything when he walks past. And so Haman, Haman he gets home and he's all, he, he's all telling his family and his friends about how he's all that. You know, and, and he, he got invited to this private banquet with the king and the queen. He's getting an ask back again tomorrow. And, you know, he's bragging on himself. But then, and he says, and then he starts getting cranky. He says, but that daggone Mordecai, that Jew, he, you know, starts rambling on about him, not showing respect to him and, and all that kind of stuff and, and wind around. So his wife and his friends, obviously wonderful people just like Haman, that, that's sarcasm, um, suggested to Haman, get rid of Mordecai right away. It said, tomorrow, you know, in the morning, ask Xerxes for permission to have Mordecai what? Yeah, I mean, a lot of translations say hanged. Uh, more Bible scholars, more modern Bible scholars think, and some translations say impaled on a pole, that they, the Persian people didn't execute by hanging, it was by impaling people on poles and, until they died and oftentimes letting them on the poles even after they died as a display of, of warning or whatever. And so Haman, man, he, they, this is his wife and his friends told him this. So old Haman, he says, hey, what? Hey, that's a good idea. I think I'll do that because he's so full of himself and thinking how wonderful he is in the king's sight right now and so forth. He says, that'll be great. And he's so confident that, that Xerxes is going to give him the permission to do that and he did what? He actually put like a scaffolding up, a, you know, a gallows up, a high thing and mounted this, this pole that, that Mordecai would be impaled upon up at the top of this really high scaffolding type structure. He had that built. And already, because he was so sure um, that Xerxes was going to give in to give, give him what he wanted. Chapter six summary: Bible scholars see the hand of God in the many quote unquote just by chance happenings in chapter six and in the rest of the story. Chapter six begins with King Xerxes just by chance, unable to what? Sleep. Unable to sleep on the night between the two banquets. Now, I would submit to you, I, I think, a reasonable understanding from the scriptural account about why Esther waited till a second day would have been that what happened in between the first and the second day, the first banquet and the second banquet. Zer if you've read the story, Xerxes couldn't sleep, and these details were read to him that made a big impact on what was going to happen. And so I would submit to you, if you're going to make any kind of an, an interpretation about maybe why Esther waited to the second day, at a minimum I think it was one of those just, just by chance type of things that God was working to, and however He did, cause Esther to wait another day because that night He was going to have... Xerxes not be able to sleep, and, and I'll, I'll go on with, with the rest of what happened. Just by chance, quote unquote, he, he was unable to sleep, so just by chance, he ordered his servants to bring the written records up to that point in his reign, in his 12 years, he had reigned for 12 years, and they kept written records of all kinds of details of, of, of the king's reign. He had someone bring that to him and read, read them to him. So, again, read to me about how great I am. You know, re read to me about all these wonderful things that, that I've done or that have happened and because of me or, or whatever. And just by chance, what section did the servants pick? I mean, the details, 12 years of reign. All the chronicles of 12 years of his reign. Who knows how many, you know, scrolls or whatever were written. They picked which one? Four years prior to this night. Not exactly, but around four years prior to this night, Mordecai had overheard, remember from the sermon last week, Mordecai had overheard of a plot to kill Xerxes. These guys that were responsible for protecting him were going to kill him. And so he saved, he, Mordecai actually saved 
the king's life that night, Xerxes' life that night. And it just so happened that that was the scroll that these servants got out and they're reading about it. And Xerxes, you know, can kind of see him, you know, he's laying in bed hearing all this stuff about himself and he hears that and he sits up and he said what to them? We we, yeah, how, did, how, did, how did we honor this, this Mordecai guy for what he did? Like, Apparently, either the king didn't even know, or he'd forgotten about it, or whatever. But he says, what, what did we do to honor this guy that saved me? And the servant said, what? Nothing. Well, nothing was ever done. And the king says, we're going to have to do something about that. Well, just, just by chance, again, hours after this all happened, who came to see the king? Haman, Haman came to see the king for what purpose? To, to get permission to kill this Mordecai. All this just so happened, right? And so, after all this just by chance stuff, Haman arrives, and before Haman can say anything to, to Xerxes, the king, the king asks Haman, how, how would you say that a man who pleases the king should be honored? Well, what do you think old Haman thought? Yeah, the king's talking about me. <laughs> He, he, he wants me to tell him what, what he should do to honor me. Uh, oh, cool. Cool. King, you know, Haman, he's still, he's still thinking he's all that, right? Do we still say that? All that? Or is that a, like I'm... Huh? Yeah, or uh, how about he's still thinking he's the bomb? Does anybody say that anymore? A lot of times, see, I even once finally when I finally learn a saying like that and what it means and stuff, and I start using it, it's already too late. We don't say that anymore, and that's part of being old. But anyway, what, however you say it, Haman really thought he was something, and he figures the king's talking about him. So Haman Haman suggests this elaborate parade of honor throughout the city, and he kind of he's 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 seeing in his mind. He's seeing himself, you know, riding riding through town, being escorted through town on this on this horse, you know, this magnificent magnificently um, decorated horse, and in this royal robe that the king himself had worn, and, and he's he's seeing it. Yeah, yeah, that's what his suggestion was, thinking that's what the king was going to do for him. Surprise, right? The king says, very well. Then you see to it that Mordecai the Jew gets honored in such a way. And Haman, you, know, you see the, you know, the cartoons, when you watch the cartoons and the dog goes, <laughs> come out of the floor. Huh? That's what I see old Haman. I, I, I bet his choppers are hanging and he's like, oh my, what? I came here to ask to have, to kill that stinking guy. And oh my word. And Haman walks out there. You know, he walks away from the king with his snoot dragging on the ground. And, oh man. And then the king told Haman to actually be the one to escort. Haman's actually leading a horse with putting the robe on Mordecai, this guy he hates and was going to kill and he's leading him all through town and, and, and honor and, and telling people to honor him and everything and Haman is like, oh my word. This didn't work out so well. This didn't go well. Well, Haman returned to his home in humiliation and his, his wonderful wife and friends, basically, uh, it seems like they saw the writing on the wall. <laughs> they, they saw his demise, Haman's demise. They, they saw like this, yeah, that didn't go well and I don't think things are going to go well for you in general. This doesn't look good. And they basically told Haman he was toast. Now, do we, do we still say that? Like, do you still say someone, someone's toast? Uh, no, probably not. It just means like they're, they're done, they're cooked, their goose is cooked. Well, I know we don't say that anymore. Again, I'm old. But we, we would used to say like if some, somebody was, you know, if somebody like even in baseball was up and he's, he's back, you know, he's batting against really good pitcher, you know, we would say this guy's toast. He's going to like whiff him, you know. I, I mean, stuff like that. Anyway, they basically told Haman he was toast. He, you know, he, he, was, he was a goner. And so at that point then, Xerxes' servants came to whisk Haman away to what? <laughs> to the second banquet. Back to the sec second banquet. So then the chapter 7 summary, as Esther, Esther's second banquet progressed, King Xerxes once again asked Esther, what, what do you want? Tell me now, what, what do you want? I'll give you up to half my kingdom, I'll give you what you want. So uh, again, whether it was just... Whether it was just Haman was in, or King Xerxes was in a specially good mood, or whether God was kind of, kind of molding his mood a little bit to be that favorable toward Esther, whatever. Remember, he hadn't called her to be in his presence in thirty days. 
So, and I said, suggested last week he may have even been having dalliances with one or more of his concubines during that time. Who, who knows? But anyway, he's still really in a good mood toward, toward Esther. And he asked her again, you know, tell me, what, tell me what it is that you want from me. I got to believe her heart was pounding at that point. You would, you would have to think so. I think she still believed that there was at least a possibility that this might not go well. Thing is, though, that she spoke very humbly. She spoke very submissively to King Xerxes. She asked for her life to be spared and that the lives of her people would be spared as well. They had all been doomed to destruction, slaughter, annihilation, she told him. Now at this point, I'm not sure that Haman or that Xerxes still understood that this people group that she was talking, her people that she was talking about, were the ones that he had gave Haman the, the authority or the approval to put the law in place to have them all executed. I don't know that he's putting the pieces together yet here. Because if he, if he would have been, I don't think he would have asked the next question. Because she's saying about that this is what's going on and that all her people are to be annihilated. And, and so, and, and also if you go back to chapter 3, Haman never actually mentioned the Jewish people. He just said, there's this people and they do things, they don't do things the way we do. They don't do stuff that you want them to do. They're just different. And, and I think it would be best for you if we just get rid of them and they're throwing back wine and, and Xerxes says, yeah, cool, go, you know, get rid of them. But you read the account. Haman never actually said it was the Jews. Or he certainly, and Haman didn't even know that it was actually Queen Esther's people. He didn't know she was a Jew. And so all these things were, were happening in the background. And so, again, at this point, the king's, the king's saying, you know, he, get, he gets furious. And he's saying, who, who ordered such a thing? Who, who did this? Who, who would dare to destroy the queen and her people? And uh, Esther basically turns and says, well, uh, that scum bucket that's sitting beside you throwing down wine with you, that vile Haman is the one who has set this all up. And I'd say at this point, Xerxes is like stunned. He's, he's enraged. He, he, he kind of storms out of the room, goes out into the garden. I think he's probably trying to like put all these pieces together like... Okay, yeah, Haman got me to sign that decree, and I didn't know, you know, I didn't, certainly didn't know it was Esther's people, and I, I didn't know she was, and, uh, and he's, he's putting this, and the more he's gone, and the, the matter he's getting. In the meantime, Haman, he knows it's looking like he's toast, right? And so he starts pleading with Esther for his life, and, and, it's, and at some point, he, he throws himself on the, the couch that she's reclining on. He throws himself on it. I, I, I expect, especially by Xerxes' reaction when he walks in here in just a moment, I expect he, I could picture him like, like holding on to her feet, like saying, please, please, oh queen, you know, save me, I beg you, please, but you know, somehow it just says he threw himself on her on the couch pleading for his life. I, I picture something like that. Like he's hanging on to her, like maybe even to her feet, just begging her to, to save his life. And right at the moment he's doing that, he's, he's like actually on Esther to some degree, and Xerxes walks back in. And Xerxes says, what are you doing? Even in my own house, you're going to molest the queen on top of everything else? And at that point it says they basically put a covering over his head because he really was toast and he was condemned to to be killed and it doesn't say but would seem reasonable that they probably took him out right right away um, because one of the servants spoke up and said well you know Mordecai or, or uh, Haman has built a you know built a, a place to impale Mordecai whom you have honored and Haman said what go kill, go kill Haman on the the, the impaling pool that he had made for Mordecai and we would have, I think it would be reasonable to expect that they immediately took him out and, and did that. Chapter 8 summary. 
So the king then gave Mordecai his signet ring that he had previously given to Haman. What was the significance of the signet ring again, in particular? Well, it, it was a seal. The, the, the king's ring, when, when, they would, when, when Haman put that law into effect on behalf of the king, that law would have been written and there would have been an, an imprint of this ring of the king made on that law. And that designated that that was a law approved by the king. And according to the laws of the Medes and Persians, it what? Could not be revoked. And so when Haman had that ring, that was great power that the king had given him because Haman, could ex Haman actually wrote and executed that law to have all the Jews killed. And then he used the king's ring to seal that law, making it non-repealable, unrepealable. Well, now the king gives that ring. He obviously took it back off of Haman before they sent him out to stick him on the pool. He gives it to who? He gives it out to Mordecai, the Jew, who went from just being about ready to be impaled upon the pool himself to he just became the second most powerful man in the Persian kingdom. <laughs> Which was the most powerful kingdom in the world at that time. Well again, that gave Mordecai the same great power to act in the king's name that Haman previously had. But there was a big problem that still remained. What was the big problem? That, that law that Haman got King Xerxes to agree to and seal with his signet ring, that law was still in effect. And that law was still what? But yeah, to, it was to execute all the, all the Jews in the whole kingdom and it was, was non-repealable. It, it couldn't be repealed. Mordecai couldn't just issue another law and sign it with the king's signet ring and say, that, uh, okay, that law isn't in effect anymore. That's not the way it worked. That's why the, law, the laws of the Medes and the Persians were so critical that when they put a law in effect, it could not be repealed even by another law. And that's a key part to all this. Once again, I used the example last week when, uh, when David... It was, you know, captive. And after the, uh, the Medes and the Persians overthrew the Babylonians as the world power, and now King Darius, who was a Mede, was, was in power. And he liked, Dan he liked Daniel, but the, his wise men tricked him into signing a law that anybody who worshipped anybody other than the king would be thrown in the lion's den. And then when that got found out, the, even though Darius liked Daniel, he couldn't, he couldn't revoke that law. And he couldn't figure out any other way around it. And he had said, Daniel, I pray something like, I pray your God can help you. And of course, his God did help him. But that, that's a similar situation. That even the king could not repeal the law once it was put into place. And that's a big part of, big part of all this story. So King Xerxes, though, gave permission for Mordecai to write a new decree. Because Esther, you know, again, Esther has begged him, you know, you've you got to stop this some way. There has to, you got to find some way to, to, to stop this from happening. And so Xerxes gave permission for Mordecai to write a new law, a new decree in his name and seal it with his signet ring. And again, that would be unrevocable when he did that. But Mordecai could write, to, write the, the decree, but again, he couldn't just say the previous dec decree is gone. He had to figure out a way to save the Jewish people while leaving that first decree that they all be slaughtered in place. That was the dilemma. So Mordecai had to come up this, with this way to prevent the slaughter of the Jews while the decree that they be slaughtered remained in place. That was the trick. And, and especially for people who, I think this is really important to understand the rest of the story, especially for those who would um, have a problem with the way this ends up, and the fact that there are people that end up getting killed, uh, many people who were enemies of the Jews, but you've got to understand it was the only way that it, that it was going to prevent the Jews from being killed. And I could digress on 
a lot of things with this, but I won't with my desire to, to stay reasonable with time today. I'm, I'm going to resist a very strong urge to give you some comparisons to today, but I will not. Comparisons about self-defense and other things, but I'm not going to do that. Chapter 9 summary. When the day originally decreed by Haman for the slaughter of the Jews came, remember, it was a future date. And all this stuff happened, and that date still hadn't come yet, obviously. And so that date's still in the future. So whenever that day came to be, summarizing chapter 9, the, the, uh, the triumph of the Jews was complete because they were given the authority to defend themselves. And, and they were given the authority even to, um, even to pursue those who were enemies against them within the Persian kingdom, those who hated them, to take them out before they would take the Jews out. Because when, when, when the decree was issued, people still, you know, even, even after this change in the power structure and stuff, and remember, you're talking about all through the Persian kingdom, but there were still people who were, on that, on that day, set out to kill Jews. Even after all this other stuff happened. So what Mordecai put into place was a decree that the Jews could arm themselves and defend themselves against these people who would come against them. And like I said, that defense included going on the offense at times to root out those that they knew were against them and hated them and would, were plotting against them and so forth. All, all this is how Mordecai got around. The decree was still in place. And legally, these people could still go kill Jews. But Mordecai put in a decree that wasn't in before that the Jews could fight back. They could arm themselves however they needed to be. And many scholars believe basically and the, the Persian government officials and, and soldiers and so forth, not only did they not help the people that were trying to kill the Jews, they probably helped the Jews. <laughs> they probably, again, Mordecai was in a position of great power and had the king on his side. And so you see how the tables were turned so dramatically. Many, many of the people of other nationalities in the Persian kingdom actually came to fear the Jews in all this, all this series of events that, that went on here. And it says even some of them, it sounds like, began to become allies of the Jews. And some of them, it sounds like, even started to participate in Jewish worship practices. Uh, we're, we can't be exactly sure about what all happened with that, but, but there were mentions of that, that kind of a thing in, in the account. Again... The inference that God had to be involved in this is you, you can't miss it. And, and I think there's a, there's a literary effect of, you know, it, nowhere in, in Esther does it say, and God did this, and God did that, and God prevented this, and God made this happen. It doesn't say that anywhere. But there's a, there's a literary effect. There's a, there's a style of writing in which something that's pretty obvious isn't mentioned, and it actually heightens how obvious it is that it causes the reader who, who's, who's reading this account where God's not mentioned in, in any of this, but it causes the reader to say, God had to be in this. He had to be in it. It causes the reader to actually come to the conclusion. And that's part of the explanation relative to um, why, why God isn't even mentioned in any of this when it seems so obvious that He had to be involved in it. Many say it was an actual literary device to cause the reader to say God had to be in this, to come to the conclusion themselves, even though it's, even though it's not written there. In any case, um, the Jews killed 500 men in Susa that day. Um, men that were, were, were setting out to destroy them, destroy the Jews. The ten sons of Haman were also killed. And after their death, post-mortem, they were, at Esther's direction, impaled upon poles to display them as, as a warning. You come against the Jews, here's what's going to happen to you. And again, a lot of people get uncomfortable with, oh, I don't know if I can deal with that. Esther, you know, even after they're dead, Esther, after Esther directed that these dead sons of Haman be impaled on poles as an exhibit don't mess with the Jews type of thing. But that's, that's exactly what it says. King Xerxes also granted Esther's request to have an extra day that the Jews in Susa could go out and kill their enemies. In other words, the, the declaration was only for one day and that, that they could defend themselves and kill their enemies and so forth. 
that, you know, that Mordecai put in place, but King Xerxes actually allowed a second day that the Jews could do this in Susa, but nowhere, out, nowhere outside of the city of Susa in the kingdom, but just, just in Susa. And so in Susa, then, then they went on, on the offensive for another day, and, and um, in the rest of the kingdom on the first day, 75,000 of their enemies were killed. And that would have been on the 13th of, of that month. But the conflict in Susa went on the 13th and the 14th. And that's the reason behind, if you've read the account, that's the reason that there were actually celebrations on two days, the 13th and the 14th, because in Susa, they actually did involve, they were involved in the conflict two days, whereas in the rest of the kingdom, it, it, was, only, it was only one day. In, in any of those places, they, the Jews killed their enemies, but they did not do what, if you read the account? They did not take any of the plunder. They did not take any of the, the valuables and the, you know, the things of the people that they killed. And the only reason it could seem to be that why they didn't do that is they, they wanted there to be no question. They didn't go on. They didn't do this to get rich out of it. They didn't do this to gain possessions. They did this because these people were going to kill them. It was, again, an act, albeit of a short warfare, but it was an act of defense. Not, not for them to gain riches. And so again, the differing days of the original uh, victory celebrations, they, uh, you know, in both cases, after the two days in, in, in Susa and the one day in the rest of the kingdom, you know, after the one day in the rest of the kingdom, the rest of the kingdom, the Jews held this big celebration. But in Susa, the Jews were still actively pursuing their enemies. And then it was on the day after that, that, that they actually had the big celebration. So there were celebrations held on two days. The rest of the kingdom outside of the Susa on, the, on the, the day after the first day of the offensive, and then the, the, the Jews in Susa itself after the second day, because they were the only ones that had the second day. And that, that led in again to two days being observed in the celebration that was actually declared that the Jews were supposed to remember thenceforth going forward. And every understanding I have is that Jews today still observe this festival, this feast, which is called what? Purim. Yeah, Purim or Purim. And that, that comes for, uh, from, as I'm, I'm going, to, go, going to describe here, that when, when, Haman, when Haman decided what month and day all the Jews were going to be killed, how did he do it? How did he decide what month and day it was going to be? He essentially rolled the dice. He, he cast the poor. And, and that word poor was a reference to a, a lot. Cast a lot. And, and a lot, casting lots was like drawing straws, rolling dice, flipping coins, what, whatever. Just a, a, an act of chance. And that's how Haman determined the month and the day that the Jews would all be killed. And that now, that poor, that act of him casting the lot, that poor turned into the Feast of Purim. Purim is actually the plural of poor. The, the Feast of Purim is a remembrance of all this stuff that went on. And they usually started out with Esther's fast on the day before, remembering when Esther and her attendants and all the Jews in Susa fasted for three days. The day before the, the day of Purim, the, the Jews fast. Esther's fast, and then on, on Purim, and actually their fast goes over two days. It goes, of course, the Jewish calendar, the, Jewish calendar, the days went from like 6 o'clock one evening till 6 the next evening, so it covered two of our calendar days, and there's a lot of stuff involved that way. But basically, on Purim, they, they start out with a fast, and then they have a day of celebration and giving of gifts, and just time of, of joy, of remembering how God delivered the Jews who were to be slaughtered and annihilated, and how God delivered them through Esther and Mordecai, working through Esther and Mordecai on these events that we read through in, in, the, in the, the book of Esther. And so chapter 10 is just three verses. It simply comments on how powerful King Xerxes was. And it makes a summary statement of how Mordecai the Jew rose from being hated and nearly assassinated under the rule of Xerxes to becoming second in power only to the most powerful man in the world, Xerxes in the most powerful kingdom of the world at the time, the Persian kingdom. It would seem like a miracle, right, for all that to happen? Some of us might even say it was an act of God, which, of course, is the conclusion that many of us believe that's what we are 
being herded to all the way through the book of Esther. God was sovereignly protecting the Jewish people as He always has, as He always will. Many things are described in the book of Esther that surely were beyond anyone's control but God. And what irony! King Vashti, a Persian woman, was kicked out of the throne, and Esther, a Jewess, was put, in, put on the throne. Haman, in the second highest position in the kingdom, who hated the Jews, was brought down so that Mordecai and the Jews, who were the ones who had been hated, ended up with power and honor. A decree that would have wiped out the Jews was overcome by a decree that led to the destruction of 76,000 of the Jews' enemies. And the casting of a lot, the poor, which was intended to lead to the annihilation of the Jews, instead resulted in the establishment of Purim, a celebration of the salvation of the Jews and their victory over their enemies. Now, close this up. I'm, I'm not doing too bad for me um, here today. Finish this up with my so what. Okay? All that was, again, these narratives, that's all background information, understanding the book and so forth, but okay, so what for you? So what for me? First of all, Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but it's, the lots, every decision is from the Lord. It's basically saying, every roll of the dice... The outcome on the dice is of the Lord. Now, real quickly, because I don't want to end up taking too much time, but that doesn't mean that every time someone rolls the dice that God changes what it turns out to be. But sometimes He does. That's the point. Either way, He's in control of it. He can change anything. He can cause anything to be whatever He wants to be. That's what Proverbs 16.33 is talking about. Martin DeHaan II said this, Most people would say that the results of casting lots, drawing straws, rolling dice, and stuff like that are nothing more than pure luck, just a matter of chance. But from the Christian's perspective, there is no such thing as pure chance. God is either directly or indirectly involved in everything. Now what have you heard me say very often that's similar to that statement? God either causes or God allows Everything. And that, that echoes what Martin DeHaan II said. Continuing Martin DeHaan II's quote, he says, God can therefore be trusted and obeyed in any circumstance because even the smallest details are under His control. End quote. Things don't just happen to people who love God. They are planned by His own dear hand. Then they're molded and shaped and timed by His clock. Stuff doesn't just happen. Stuff is planned by God. God is behind the scenes, and God controls the scenes that He is behind. Stephen Cole wrote this, There is no such thing as luck or pure chance. The Bible often teaches and illustrates the doctrine of God's providence. What is God's providence? That's His sovereign supremacy and control and superintendence over all the universe. That is God's providence. And God's providence, Stephen Cole says, should be a source of great comfort and instruction for every believer. It means that God is not distant. God is not passive in things, sitting back and saying, well, what happens, happens. God is not unconcerned with the daily events in our lives. When we face trials, we should trust God's providence to work out His plan for our lives, even whenever it's a not good situation for us. God is actively controlling or directing even evil events and even people, evil people, in such a way as to accomplish His purposes, His sovereign will. But He's not the author of evil, and He's not responsible for evil. See Ephesians 1.11. But no evil person, no evil act, changes or thwarts God's sovereign will. It's a big so what out of the book of Esther because it's just as true today as it was during the days of Esther and Mordecai and all those Jews. Charles Spurgeon said this. Now some of this language again, Charles Spurgeon was what back in the 1800s I think, but th this is sweet and I'm, I'm going to try to slow down and read it. To listen to this. How great is the providence of God to a child of God when he can reflect upon it he can look out on the world and say, However great my troubles, they are not so great as my Father's power. However difficult may be my circumstances, yet all things around me are working together for good. 
He who holds up the starry heavens can also support my soul without any apparent prop, something to hold it up. He who guides the stars in their well-ordered courses, surely He can overrule my trials in such a way that even when they seem to move about strangely and in, in confusion, He will bring order. He will bring order from even seeming evil. He who bridles the storm, He who puts the bit in the mouth of the tempest, surely He can restrain my trial and keep my sorrows in subjection. I need not fear while lightnings are in His hands and the thunders sleep within His lips, while the oceans gurgle forth from His fist and the clouds are in the hollow of His hands, while the rivers are turned by His foot and while He digs the channels of the sea. Surely He whose wings an angel... I guess said that wrong. Surely He whose might... Wings an angel, whose power enables an, an angel to move. Surely he can furnish a warm with strength. He who guides an angel will not be overcome by the trials of a warm like me. He who makes the greatest star roll in dignity and keeps its predestined orbit can make a little atom like me move in my proper course and conduct me, conduct me as he pleases. Christian, there is no sweeter pillow than providence, the providence of God. And when providence seems adverse, when it seems bad, when God's allowing something that is not good, believe in it still, Spurgeon said. Lay it under your head and depend on it, for there is comfort in its bosom. There is hope for you, child of God. What he's saying is that even... We've talked about this in, in past sermons, even this year already. That even in the midst of really bad things, there, there is a comfort that we can know in understanding that it is not just happening by chance. It is not happening outside of the knowledge and approval of God at a minimum. We can understand that there is purpose behind even our worst moments. And again, I share this stuff knowing that I may be the one in that situation before this day ends. I Believe me, I don't, I don't throw this out there in a flip kind of a, just a, I'm the preacher and I say these kind of things. I know that this is me too. It has already been me in my life. That even in the worst of times, I can know that it is within God's providence for that to happen to me. I may not understand why, but I can know and believe that it is, and I can actually find a comfort in that. To know that I am still in God's hand, even in the midst of some awful things happening to me. That is a, that is a core Christian faith belief that I think you have to have a certain level of faith to be able to, to be allowed to receive. I think if you are a nominal Christian, I think if you are not really walking daily with the Lord, I think if you are not regularly studying in His Word to understand His Word, I don't know that you can get to that point. It's hard enough when you are doing all those things and when you are really hurting to be able to find that comfort. But it's there. It is there. And I have at times experienced it and other times I, I couldn't get it. I wanted it, but I couldn't get it. But it's there. And it's a very real part of being a follower of Jesus. Spurgeon told the story of a prostitute who had, who had bottomed out in life. She was on her way to the Blackfriars Bridge to jump to her death. As she passed by the building Spurgeon was preaching in that Sunday night, she just happened to decide that she would go in before killing herself and possibly hear something that maybe would prepare her to stand before her maker when she did kill herself. Well, Spurgeon just happened to be preaching in Luke chapter 7 about the woman well known in town for her sexual sins who washed Jesus' feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. And as she did that in sincere repentance of her sins when she was before Jesus that night. As Spurgeon preached that, the prostitute was, that, that had heard Spurgeon's words that night was blown away with the thought that she would hear herself described and her life pictured in that account from the Bible about the woman who again wet Jesus' feet with her tears and washed 
his feet with her hair in sincere repentance. That prostitute could not fathom that she walked in there and heard that that applied to her to a T, she who was on her way to take her life. And how God so wonderfully in His providence that night had Spurgeon preaching in that passage, had that prostitute going to take her life, walk past where he was preaching, just happened to decide to go in there before she took her life. And in all the providence of God, the wonderful providence of God that night, He not only saved her untimely death, but He saved her eternal life. As she, like that woman before Jesus, Though Jesus wasn't physically there, shed her tears, and it was as though in her repentance that she wiped the feet of Jesus in sincere repentance that she came to Him that night. And instead of dying, instead of killing herself, went forward from that point that night as a child of God. What wonderful providence of God. A.M. Overton wrote this. It's called, He Makes Not One Mistake. My father's way may twist and turn. My heart, my heart may throb and ache. But in my soul I'm glad I know He makes not one mistake. My cherished plans may go astray. My hopes may fade away. But I'll trust my Lord to lead. For He does know the way. Though the night be dark, and it may seem that day will never break, I'll pin my faith, my all in Him. Because he makes not one mistake. There's so much now I cannot see. My eyesight's far too dim. But come what may, I'll simply trust. And I'll leave it all to him. For by and by the mist will lift. And plain it all he'll make. Through all the way, though dark to me, he made not one mistake. John, <laughs> John Blanchard said the same God who controls the sun cares for the sparrow. Why should we be so anxious and fearful about what tomorrow holds when we know the one who holds tomorrow? God is in control. God is at work in our lives. Even in the really bad times and even when we can't ever understand I sure don't say this lightly. Because in this past week, a little nine-year-old boy lost his life. And his mommy and daddy and family laid him in the grave. But it's these times that we have to most remember the providence of God. And He's good all the time. And we can find great comfort in knowing that. I'll just read the first verse of the closing hymn. It's day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Listen now. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, trusting in what He chooses to cause or allow to come my way, I have no cause for worry. Or fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. He lovingly gives us both pain and pleasure and mingles toil with peace and rest. The closing hymn is 718, day by day, and I'd ask you as you sing that, what, watch the words, as you always should. Sing the words. Watch those next two verses too, the truths in that. Might we be able to live by faith in a providential God who loves us and is in control of things even when the worst of life comes our way. 718, day by day, please stand as we sing.